Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Welcome to our webinar, Praying with Trustful Surrender, presented by Makani Marquis. My name is Megan Ramore, and I'm an assistant coordinator in ministries and outreach for the Archdiocese of Vancouver. And helping behind the scenes tonight is Sister John Mary Sullivan. Tonight's webinar is being hosted through St. Monica's Mission, an initiative of the Archdiocese of Vancouver, launched on the Feast of St. Monica, August 27th last year. Through this initiative, parents are encouraged to pray, fast, and sacrifice for the conversion of their adult children who are no longer practicing their faith. And to begin our time together this evening, we will be inviting St. Monica to pray for us um, as we pray our opening prayer together, which will be shared on screen in just a moment. It's in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear St. Monica, you are once the mournful mother of a prodigal son. Your faithfulness to prayer brought you and your son so close to God that you are now with him in eternity. By your intercession and God's grace, your son, St. Augustine, became a great and venerable saint of the church. Through sorrow and pain, you constantly devoted yourself to God. Pray for me that I might join you in such a deep faith in God's goodness and mercy. Above all, dear St. Monica, pray for me that I may, like your son, turn from my sin and become a great saint for the glory of God. Amen. St. Monica, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So the great spiritual director, St. Claude de la Colombière, said, it is all the more remarkable that the more we submit to God's will, the more he tries to meet our wishes. Very often in our lives and in our prayers, we hold hidden conditions, expectations, and desires that can be obstacles to a deeper union with Christ, and in turn, an obstacle to the efficacy of our prayers. To help parents continue through St. Monica's mission, a prayerful journey of perseverance and hope, Tonight, we will learn how to uncover and remove some of those hidden obstacles and how to move forward in prayer with deeper trust, peace, and joy. Our presenter tonight is Makani Marquis, who spent eight years living as a hermit in Idaho, the Sunshine Coast, and Hawaii. Through his experience in prayer and ministry, an emphasis on living in God's providence and receiving what the Lord is offering is a constant desire of his heart. Makani is the Senior Director of Communications at the Archdiocese. He has been married to Lisa for six years, and they have two beautiful children, Rachel and Joseph. After Makani's presentation, we will have an opportunity for Q&A, so please feel free to enter any questions into the Q&A box at any point during Makani's presentation. And with that, let's welcome Makani. Hello, everyone. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. I'd love to share on this topic, and, and I... I hope you are excited about it. I, I am, and I hope you get a lot out of it. Um, I'll put up a um, PowerPoint with me as I'm going through this. There won't be a lot in it, but you might find it valuable just to have something um, to see at the same time. Um, as Megan mentioned, I spent eight years living as a hermit and um, would go half a year at a time without speaking to people. Um, so learned a lot about prayer in that amount in that time that most people don't usually have the opportunity to get access to and, and um, or at least not in that way. And I'm hoping to share um, just a little bit of what I learned or the what I'm going to say is the, the most important stuff that I um, learned and an aspect of this is what I'm calling praying with trustful surrender. And um, the, the thing that I want to unpack in this talk are the following things. Uh, to cover what is praying with trustful surrender, what do I mean by that? Um, and um, getting into why it's important, why that can be a very powerful thing. And then to look at the kinds of conditions that we do hold on to that, are, that can be in opposition to this kind of prayer. And how this prayer ultimately becomes uh, something that transforms our own selves. By the way, if you hear any uh, children in the background, the uh, my wife Lisa is putting the little ones to bed, so no apologies there. Should be <laughs> they're, they're fun to hear. They're two and five years old. Um, so, what is praying with trustful surrender? 
And as I have on the screen, it means praying with complete trust, of course, a letting go of our own ideas, our own attitudes, our own assumptions, and our own fears. And I want to bring a few stories to light in relation to this. So um, in, in understanding what this is, it's uh, a little bit like contemplative prayer, but with a very particular focus or a particular um, condition. Many, many years ago, I read a book called Healing Words, which I don't recommend anybody else spend their time reading. It was a good book uh, in and of itself, but it really was just a one note book. And it was a bit, it was really about the efficacy of prayer and from a scientific point of view, and mostly about um, healing, you know, physical healing and so forth. And um, I read through the whole book and it was, and, and it told us wonderful things about the power of prayer for healing and by extension, therefore the power of prayer for everything else, especially in the, in the temporal world. And um, there was one component of the book that was completely and utterly fascinating. It was a very small section, but it, to me, it should have been the entire book. And that's what I want to share with you. So the, in the book, they share, um, about a series of um, scientific studies that were done on uh, the efficacy of prayer now for healing. And um, it's hard to do those kinds of studies for healing because um, the placebo effect and subjective interaction becomes a, a difficult thing to be able to measure if people know they're being prayed for and all that sort of thing. So what they did is um, this uh, group in the United States, they did it with plants whom they figured wouldn't have that kind of awareness. And um, so they would wash the plants in like beds of plants in in uh, in acid, or they would stress them in a in a predictable way that that caused a lot of damage. And then they'd put them into three into actually initially it was just two different rooms, and um, they brought people in to pray for the healing of the plants, and um, and then they measured the effect to see if there was any degree of effectiveness. Um, with this and as predicted and just as they found with um, the more anecdotal human trials um, with prayer there was an effect and it was definitely that the plants just like with people experience um, a higher percentage of healing because of the power of prayer and they did it as a double blind and all of that but they did one particular expansion of this one and um, which is where they took three rooms and they took three different sets of plants and the first one they had as they just left as the control group. So nobody's praying over it. The second group was the ones where they brought in a prayer group um, to pray over the plants, to heal them. But then they had a third. And the third group they brought in was to pray over the plants that God do whatever he wanted to do with the plants. So there was no objective in a sense, except to ask God to do whatever he wanted to do with the plants. Now they had to spend time doing this praying. So it wasn't, you couldn't just show up and go, well, God would do whatever you want, but really to be sincerely letting go of their own ideas of what God might want to have happen with them and just say, God, you can, you can make them better. You can make them worse. You can leave them the same, do what you will, essentially that great fiat prayer. And the, the, the effectiveness of this was so amazing to me, and it still is, um, and, it, and it, it encapsulates what is praying with trust and surrender. It's playing, it's praying without that um, agenda or so many aspects of the agenda that we normally bring to prayer. And to demonstrate the power of it, the results were that um, the plants that were prayed over actively for healing did, in, do, did indeed consistently do better than the ones that had no prayer over them by a matter of between 10 and 20% better every time. But with the third group where people came in and prayed, God, do whatever you will, the actual improvement was over 200%. Now that's astonishing. When I first read that, I was blown away. I've looked it up since and the, uh, the various studies that were done, a 200% increase in the healing of those plants. Clearly God wanted the plants to be healed. Um, this for myself and my own journey became more important when I lived as a hermit. And um, 
I would spend my days uh, usually outdoors in amongst uh, nature and praying rosaries, etc. And then God would bring people into my awareness, into my attention, and I would be praying for them. And if I really knew the person or I thought I knew the person well, I'd be praying for particular intentions and so forth, which is very good, by the way. And let me just say right now that in the talk, in, in, in this talk, I am not saying that we shouldn't pray <laughs> for things in a very specific way. I'm just offering another way of praying that I've found really powerful and useful. So I will also pray for very particular intentions of people and so forth. But um, what I found was it was easier in those contexts to embrace this kind of non-directed prayer, where I let God direct what he's going to do with that prayer and not have an agenda or not have an agenda sounds too manipulative, but not have my own um, preconceived ideas of what an outcome should look like for the person that I'm praying for. And so um, in Hermitage, I, I spent a lot of time with um, uh, praying that God will do what he wishes to do for whatever soul. And uh, in my first few years of praying this way, it was very vague. It's very much the way I'm presenting it here. I, I would say to the Lord, you know, hold up this person. And I would say to God, do what you will with them. I trust you. I would like nothing but whatever you will to do for them. And I, I wouldn't bring up a lot of specifics in my mind, because of course you kind of try not to do that. Um, and, and it was quite powerful. And it was powerful for me because it meant letting go of a lot of different things in the way that I would, was accustomed to praying for people. Um, but I also found that when I did um, come back into the world and have some touch points and then leave again, um, I found that the efficacy of, the, of praying like that was truly much more powerful than many of the other ways that I prayed much more intentionally. And it, it leads me down this path to share because I, I'm, I am, I'm very excited about it. One of the times that where it most came home to me that I'd like to share with you uh, as another example of what is praying with trustful surrender, what does that look like? What does that mean? Comes when I was in uh, Hawaii um, as a hermit, because my uh, little cabin in the middle of nowhere, Idaho was uh, sold after uh, five years. So I had to have my last uh, three years in Hawaii. I know, big sacrifice. Uh, but, at least, but I was still alone. I was in a tent in one of the most secluded parts of um, one of the islands. And um, there, I, I actually had a, um, uh, a place where I was that um, was on the property of, of a couple, a Christian couple. And they knew that I was a hermit. They didn't really know much what that was. But um, one afternoon, they came to me and uh, they said that a, a friend of theirs that they knew quite well um, was in need of serious, serious prayer. He had just had an accident on the ocean that split his head open. They weren't expecting him to live. In fact, I think the day before, a similar thing had happened to somebody in Honolulu, and that person died. Um, they figured even if he survived, he'd be a vegetable. That was pretty much an accepted understanding. But they were just praying for a miracle. They wanted the miracle, and um, they were so distraught. So I said I would pray. And I decided I would, again, pray in this more non-directed way where I wouldn't be telling God how to do things or what exactly the outcome should be, but to spend time with the Lord lifting this person up and, and letting go. And the way that it came about this time was I started imagining various scenarios uh, from, from the praying that I was doing. So as an example, I, uh, I imagined the, um, the person being completely and utterly healed, no brain damage, uh, et cetera, and how wonderful that would be. And then I checked my own emotional state and went, oh, okay, yeah, that feels really good. Of course it does. And then I prayed that he succumbed to the injuries and pass away. And of course, I didn't really like that one very much. And I started to do a bit of a check on myself and say to the Lord, and I offered this up to the Lord saying, I guess I'm not really surrendering because I really kind of do want this one. And I'm not really as excited about this one. But if you did this one, 
I want to be just as excited because it will be your will. I'm going to trust you that this is what you want for the person. It's a hard thing to do. So I started imagining other scenarios. I started imagining um, this person with in a vegetative state, for example, um, situations with his family. I started imagining what would happen if people came back to me and said that, that as a result of my prayer, he was healed. And what would that do internally to me? And how would I like that? Or if they came to me and said, you prayed. And as soon as you started praying, everything went south. We don't want you to, <laughs> we don't want you to do this anymore. And <laughs> how horrible that would feel. And could I bring myself in prayer to say yes to each and every one of those? It's a practice that St. Claude de la Colombière, one of my favorite saints, uh, who was the spiritual director of St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, it's one of his um, it's one of his ways of praying. He's he says, it doesn't matter which way it comes, Lord, you do what you will, and I will, and I'll do my best to love it. And I'll pray for it that way ahead of time. In fact, St. Claude has a morning exercise prayer, which is, he says, immediately upon waking, imagine every possible terrible thing that could happen to you today. And don't rest, don't start your day until you have totally agreed with all of these things, and then go about your day. Um, <laughs> and then no matter what happens, you'll be at peace. And, uh, but you will have brought yourself much closer to the Lord in a trustful surrender. Well, I took that quite literally in this type of prayer for this person. And I ended up spending hours and hours because I, I just kept going over the same types of prayers, trying to come to the awareness of what would it mean if God brought this person back to health in a way that was difficult? What if it wasn't something that his family really loved? What if it meant he came back and, and became an alcoholic? What if it meant he came back and... Um, or didn't come back and, and his family had to deal with that great loss and all of these things until I could come to a point of peace to be able to say that when I heard the news back, whatever it might be, that my reaction, my emotional reaction, even my attitudinal reaction for sure, could be, thank you. Yes, this is just so. I trust that you have taken all this prayer and that you are doing the right thing, Lord, and that no matter what, because you always bring good out of evil, always. I trust that that's what you're doing here. And it took hours and hours and hours. And um, I went to bed, it was in early afternoon when they brought this over to me. And I think I went to bed with that exercise still going on. The beautiful thing of that story, yes, he was completely and miraculously healed. And um, no brain damage whatsoever. <laughs> in fact, I think two weeks later, he, he held a little family luau and invited everybody who'd prayed for him to come. I was a hermit, so I didn't go. Um, anyway, that was really powerful for me. And it's something that I want to share with you because that type of praying, when I do that kind of prayer, and I've done that prayer a lot since as well, I have found, just like those studies found, that the power of those prayers have a dual effect. One is I have found that generally they are more efficacious, better, bigger, more miraculous things. That's been my experience have happened. The other thing is they have deeply affected and transformed me in my faith life and increased and made closer my relationship with Christ in a way that um, few other things could. Um, I want to talk about why this kind of prayer is important. And it is along the lines of what I just mentioned. It's because it's all about the relationship and not about outcomes so much. Now, as St. Claude says, we're not forbidden to pray for things that we want, especially if they are deeply good things like the faith of a child or the faith of anybody for that matter. Uh, graces and virtues are things that we should be praying for for people and God God loves to go into those and pardon me and uh, answer those prayers not necessarily in our timing but in his but not so much focused on outcomes in this type of prayer it's much more about the relationship as I said and again back to that quote from Saint Claude now in the context of the stories that I just shared it is all the more remarkable that as we submit to God's will more, the more he tries to meet our wishes. 
Now, how is that? What does that look like? What, what does that mean? Well, I, I invite you to think of a relationship um, when you're in a, uh, like a spousal relationship where you're, you're able to communi- be in communion with another person that you are so in love with and is so in love with you and is in tune and you completely trust one another. Um, you can let go of your desires in order to fulfill the desires of the person you love. That's the thing you live for. That's the thing you want to do when you're in a deeply loving relationship. Um, they in turn anticipate your needs, right? They are, they're looking out for what great, wonderful thing can I give my partner? And it's so much harder to do. It's so much harder in relationship when all we do is seek to have things our way and make a litany of requests and desires of the other person. It becomes a, it's a more difficult dynamic of an, you know, relationship, right? Um, so when it's, I'll give you an example. This might not be a great example, but it's one I thought of that I, it just strikes me. Imagine that you are married and you're married to a world-class chef um, who's desperately in love with you and can't wait to please you in any way possible and is um, just ready and waiting to, to um, do whatever you really, what you really desire and deeply want. And so you ask for a meal. And of course, it's a world-class chef. And you ask for this meal, of course, as a chef, the, the, the spouse is going to go, oh, this is perfect. How wonderful. I'm going to be able to cook you the greatest possible thing. Your mouth is never going to be the same. You will never have experienced the kinds of things I'm going to cook for you the greatest meal. But before you get, before that's possible, what you do is you start dictating how the chef should prepare the meal. You start telling them what ingredients to use. You start telling them in what order they should do things. You start uh, dictating to them the timing of all of the pieces. You start telling them the various types of ingredients you want to mix together and how it should come and all of the rest of that. And even ask for things that aren't even on the menu, like the ingredients that don't even, uh, that you don't even have. Um, Lovingly, that chef is going to have a couple reactions. (laughs) First, be very disappointed. Um, but also won't be able to do everything you ask, partly because the ingredients are there, aren't all there, but also because some of this is going to taste really awful. And the loving partner is not going to want to give that to you. And is aching to be able to deliver the thing that knows that that person knows would satisfy you. But you're busy telling the chef the best possible way you want the food and you don't know anything about food. That's kind of the, the way we are with God. And in the praying, uh, in the way of trustful surrender, we're letting the chef do everything. We are trusting that what's going to come out, even though we won't have a reference point for it from ourselves before, and that we're a little bit in the dark, we don't know how long it's going to take. We don't know the ingredients that are going to be used. We don't know savory or sweet. We don't know uh, timing. We don't know how much. All of that is unknown and we let it be unknown because we trust the other. We trust the chef. So, so saying that just as the points are uh, the second, the last two points on the screen are the value of prayer stems primarily from the depth of our relationship we have that we have with God, not for what it does. And we can all get trapped in that. I know I have for, and I still, I still do sometimes get back into that. I'm looking for, the the value of prayer in the way I think it should happen. But the effects of prayer are due to the relationship we have and not to a particular means either. So even in praying in this way, it's I have to be aware that this is not the only way to pray. (laughs) This is not uh, the end all and be all. It really is about the relationship first and foremost. Um, There's a there's a lot, there's a story in the lives of the desert fathers. Of course, I, I, as a hermit, loved the story of the original hermits of the desert back in the fourth century. And um, one of them that illustrates this point, I'm just going to read off a piece of paper here. There's a story in the lives of the desert fathers of a laborer whose fields always gave better crops than those of his neighbors. When asked the reason, he replied, 
that he always had whatever kind of season or weather he chose. I never wish for any other kind of weather, but what God wishes, he explained. And as I wish for everything that pleases God, he too gives me the sort of crop that pleases me. There are other point, uh, there are other quotes that I can grab, and I don't want to make it something that you can assume. So it's not like, well, if I surrender what I want, and I just say, God, do whatever you want, and thank you for everything that comes, then there's that little secret thing, well, then he'll give me the very thing that I want. That's still a condition. We really do have to let it go, just like that great spousal relationship where you simply throw yourself into the other and you allow them to take care of your needs. Um, so speaking of that, let's explore some of the conditions that, that uh, we might have in our prayers right now. So I've had a lot of conversations um, over time, giving many talks on prayer, um, expanded uh, talks on prayer, not just about trustful surrender. And I've had people that have come up and have talked to me about um, the situation with their son or their daughter or sons or daughters um, who are far from the faith or are, who are going down a path um, that is leading them away, away from the Lord. And even we'll, we'll talk about this, but then very often as, as I get to know their story and their situation, and I understand what they're praying for, I realize that just like all of us, we have certain things that we want to have as outcomes for those uh, children. So we have to ask some questions. If we want to pray in this way, do we need to at least explore the conditions that we're putting up and to see if we can in a way of St. Claude, the Desert Fathers, and so forth, to be able to let go of some of them so that God has a freer hand. So how do you want your children to return to the faith? Um, what's the manner of the return that you pray for? Is there a particular way that you see them coming back when you, when you pray about it? Is there a story in your mind of how that should go? And then, of course, the question is naturally, can you let that go? Another question, how would you like not to see them return? Um, a good friend of mine uh, who passed away a number of years ago, she um, is an icon of faith and her whole family was a very faithful family, but she had a younger brother, her youngest brother, actually, uh, very early on in his um, adult life, got into drugs and alcohol in a really serious way and lived on um, Skid Row. He lived in the downtown east side, um, needles, um, almost died many times and was resuscitated and spent years in that kind of lifestyle. And of course, in her praying for her brother to return to faith, um, she had particular ideas of the way that she wanted him to return. And very often, that's the way in which we saw them before or a type of them, a type of living situation for them that agrees with what we would want. What, um, his name was Brian, what, it, what ended up happening with Brian was he got into AA and uh, he found his faith there, which was beautiful. And, um, but he still struggled throughout the rest of his life, even though most of that time was spent with a relationship with God. And most of that time was spent trying to help other people who were uh, victims of addiction and um, uh, getting them out of it, even though he would sometimes fall back in himself. He still hung around with the crowd that I'm, none of his family would have wanted to have been around. But he had a relationship with God that was probably closer than most of his siblings. Probably we would not accept that kind of life of a return to faith for most of our children when we pray for them. Interesting. I mean, I wouldn't, um, but it's interesting to note. How would you like them not, how would you like not to see them return? And can you give that up? Can you accept them returning partially, at least at first? And this, this can be taxing because, um, especially on patients, if you see a, a little thread, a glimmer of hope, um, then, then sometimes our, ten, our tendency is to tug really hard on that, on that line. 
So I have siblings who are not uh, of the faith and, and when they express anything that might be towards that, I can, I can sense sometimes hear from my own parents that they just start in preaching and asking for more and wanting faster results. And sometimes that can spoil things. And, but it also, again, reflects that idea that maybe we are not allowing God to work in his own time, which brings us to the next point. When do you want them to return to the faith? Now, of course, <laughs> who would not want them now, or at least soon um, in your lifetime. And this is an interesting one. Can you pray in a way that says, um, I trust you, Lord, to bring them back into the fold in whatever way that happens. And you can do it after I'm gone, if that's your will. Of course, you would love to see it. You'd love to be part of it. In fact, um, I can't imagine anybody that wouldn't want to be. But again, if you can really let those things go, it frees you up in your relationship with God. It frees up your prayer. It gives new life to it. Um, to explore why you want them to return in a particular time. What's your desire in this? And, and are you able to let that go? That's really the question you, that, um, that I'm saying you want to ask. I find it really valuable. Can I let go of the timeline that I want to see? Can I have patience in um, their journey while still trusting? With some more conditions. Um, with whom should your children return to the faith? Many stories I have of uh, people who have um, expressed to me that the main issue is that their daughter or their son is uh, in a relationship with this other person and that that's the issue, that's the problem. And it may well be. Um, but are you open to not seeing that the removal of that person or the change of that person in the way you think is the only way? Um, what would it look like if they stayed with the current person that they had, for example? Um, could you handle that? Could you, um, could you see what that's going? Um, uh, the, um, sorry, I'm distracted. This is, I think I saw a thing from Sister John Mary. <laughs> could you handle being with a different type of person? Do you want their relationships to be completely different with different people? And what if they weren't? What if they were entirely different people altogether? And could you accept that there might be other ways of people coming to the faith? I know um, one person that I know very well, in fact, is a good friend um, who was very far away from the faith and um, married somebody that had no faith. In fact, a different kind of faith, very, very different altogether. And initially, the person that was praying for their son, my friend, um, was horrified and really prayed against the relationship. <laughs> and in the end, they were praying against the conversion of their own son because um, in that marriage and as a result of that marriage even, became, came back to the church and became a staunch defender of it. So if we can let go of the means that we want to employ and let God take care of it, that's what trustful surrender prayer is. Of course, what kind of faith do you want them to experience? There's so many different ways that people understand and express faith. Um, do you, you know, we all think of faith as being much more similar to our own, our own understanding, our own, our, our own awarenesses. Oftentimes we think back to how it used to be before they lost their faith and think of them returning to that, when in fact God might be wanting them to leapfrog that and go somewhere completely different. And that we need to let go of seeing that in the prayer and say, God, bring them back in the way that you will. What if they stumble? What if they come back in, by means that are very uncomfortable, um, like through addiction recovery as an example, or following a Catholic figure that you might not like, or being very right-leaning or left-leaning? Perhaps you don't want them to become hermit. <laughs> Do you imagine them coming back as the nice child or successful or in a, in a very worldly and peaceful way? And what about suffering? Could you imagine them coming back to the faith, but as a result of something that the Lord puts on them in terms of suffering, which might be very hard for you? To be able to say yes to all of these things, to be able to at least explore the conditions that we have and to try and let go and to say that ultimate great fantastic prayer, 
not my will, but your will be done. That's the essence of this. We, um, the next slide says we, um, oops, if I get a next slide, I might not. It has stopped, there we go. We have a tendency to want our uh, kids to return based on our own ideas of what that return should look like. And this is a limitation that we don't need, um, that we don't wanna hamper God in, in what he can do. Um, the next thing, the last thing that I wanna say about it in, um, in this context is that we are transformed in this process. Um, by this kind of prayer, this trust, trust, this relationship to flow. And by this, I mean, um, I'm getting a message, my internet is unstable, so hopefully I'm not frozen for all of you. Um, maybe Sister or May can give me a thumbs up if we're good. Um, but, but praying in this way and even understanding things in this way can be um, quite powerful and and not just for the sake of the return of our children to the faith but for our very selves to grow and to deepen and by extension transform the lives of other people and make it possible interpersonally um, to get out of the way of the journey back to faith that our children might have sometimes of course some of us don't even have relationships with our children who've um, fallen away. But if you do, sometimes, and I've seen this acted out, and I think it's, uh, I think we've all seen um, situations of it where um, the interpersonal dynamics of ourselves, our own personal relationship with our children, um, can be a source of some of the tension that they have with uh, faith. So one of the other effects of praying in this very freeing way is that it starts to adjust our own attitudes um, towards them and starts to have an effect on how we are in our relationship with our children. Even if we're not speaking to them, it still has that effect. God touches everything. Um, and so this transformation in us, of course, God wants this. He wants us to be able to feel him in all events. He wants us to be able to say yes to the things that are seemingly trials, but maybe aren't so much because the effect of them in a deeply transformative way goes beyond what we be beyond our this world issues it has real effects um and 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 i don't want to deprive anybody of it think how approachable and present you would be um to everyone you know when you can let go of the conditions and take your hand off the wheel in a certain sense of how things should go, but keep everybody in prayer. Keep everybody close in prayer, hold them up to that light, but without conditions. Um, I wanna share the um, quote from St. Augustine, very apropos for this group. I'm just gonna read it out with you so you don't have to read it while I'm talking. All that happens to us in this world against our will, whether due to men or to other causes, happens to us only by the will of God, by the disposal of providence, by his orders and under his guidance. And if from the frailty of our understanding, we cannot grasp the reason for some event, let us attribute it to divine providence, show him respect by accepting it from his hand and believe firmly that he does not send it without send it us without cause um i have a a file with 16 pages in small print of the quotes from the saints that are basically summed up in this one which is we tend to see the world in very worldly ways and we often see our own um, journeys of faith and the faith of other people by the external things that we see and that's just the this world stuff. And God is usually acting in much deeper ways with all of the events that are coming about. And he can only actively give us situations or allow situations out of which greater good can come. And very often, we should be part of the bringing about of that greater good. What better way than with prayer? 
So that's just a, <laughs> this is really a summation of um, the great fiat of Mary. Let it be done according to your will. Don't do it the way I think of it. Do it the way you want it to be done. And the more that we can say that, the more powerful, the more powerfully we can help God in, in the co-creation of his world. It's interesting that that line, that type of prayer was done in two different places. One by Jesus in the garden and by Mary, of course, at um, oh, two days time is the Annunciation, uh, at the Annunciation. And at the Annunciation, by saying that, we get the savior of the universe, the most incredible possible thing to that point in the history of the entire universe of all of creation happened as a result, as a result of Mary saying, not my will, but let it be done according to your word. The second, of course, was Christ in the garden just before the passion, death, and resurrection, which was, of course, the greatest of all events in the history of the universe. And again, it was brought about because of that prayer. So I'm going to say, and, I've, and there's, there's others who've made the same point before, it's why it's in the Our Father. Let it be done on earth as it's done in heaven. The difference is on earth, we resist what he wants to do. And in heaven, there's no resistance. The last thing I want to say is um, there is a surrender novena. Um, and it, uh, it was put together based on the writings of a Don, Father Dolindo, in Italy. He was around at the same time as Padre Pio was in Italy. And he was a mystic and a... Uh, prophet and so forth. And we don't hear much about him, but he was amazing. And of course, St. Padre Pio himself says this. He said, Don Delindo is a saint. And when people came to see Padre Pio from Naples, because Delindo was in Naples, he would say, why are you coming to me? You've got a saint in Naples. Um, and that the whole of paradise was in his soul. Some of the things um, from this Surrender Novena, and I'm sure I can have it so that it's sent out to all of you. I have it in the slides here, and I might use a piece of that for our closing prayer, but it's incredibly powerful. And the words in it are echoing the types of things that are, they're already in this talk about uh, really trusting God to take care of things and getting ourselves out of the habit of the anxious ways in which we would take control of things. And a central line from Don DeLindo is, oh, Jesus, I surrender myself to you. Take care of everything. So I am going to leave it there. Megan, if you want to come back in, I'm going to leave this slide up for, or actually, I'll probably take it down because if, uh, well, we'll see. Megan, are you back? There you are. I'm back. Yes. Thanks. And yeah, uh, we can certainly, if you have um, a format of the surrender prayer, Macaulay, that we can include, we can send it out when we send out um, a recording of this talk, and that probably would be. Yeah, that's great. Welcomed, I'm sure. Um, yeah. Thank you, Makani. That was great. Um, you certainly always have some great stories and some um, wonderful insights into your um, into into prayer. Um, so a reminder that if you do have any questions, please feel free to to put them in the Q and A, and we will. We'll get to as many of them as we can. And we do have a few questions to start us off. Um, maybe Makani, maybe you should stop the screen. Yeah, I'm going to stop it. Here we go. There we go. All right. So this first one is, um, are there any practical steps to quiet the expectations and let go of the conditions? Yeah, actually, um, it's along the lines of what I shared about my own story when I, when I did it in Hawaii. What I found useful to quiet my mind and expectations was actually to acknowledge them and to sort of flip them on their head, kind of the St. Claude thing. So it's, um, um, as an example, I, I have an understanding, I have an awareness that, um, like in my case, I want my brother, for example, to be back in the faith. And... I, I simply start to imagine scenarios of him coming back, but then I start to imagine the ones I don't want to imagine. So the ones that I'm less comfortable with. So I acknowledge, yeah, I wanted to have this type of, he'd be great in this way. And I know he'd be, you know, like I have this vision of how he would be as uh, a Catholic fully back in the faith. 
And uh, so to quiet that, I actually go into other scenarios. So I imagine, for example, what if he ended up with cancer? And I, I realize this is horrible. Like you're imagining horrible things. And I, and I don't mean that in a, I'm not being trite when I say that. I'm, I'm saying this is actually quite practical and valuable. And um, so I will imagine that as being the method that God may use to bring him back even, and it might, and I can even imagine that being a very short window. And then he passes like some, I, I can imagine some things that I really don't want. And in the process of doing that, I say, yes, if you want to do it that way, Lord, I'm going to give you a free hand. Please do it that way. And the interesting thing is that that is what mostly quiets the rest of it. That's the kind of thing that for me and I've, and for others that I've known that have sort of practiced a bit of this, it really does take the edge off. It takes some of the expectations out, but it does take doing. Um, that's why the, this kind of prayer, it's not quick, like you might imagine, you might just say, yes, Lord, be it done according to your will. Okay, I'm done. Like, that's the prayer, right? But um, if you start imagining various scenarios that may be less comfortable and you can still say yes to them, or you say, at least, Lord, I want to be able to say yes to them, that is a, that is a practical thing that I find is very, very helpful for quieting the soul in terms of that anxiousness and other things. I imagine that takes some practice too. It does. And I say, and I would say, start with the small things. <laughs> so don't go to cancer. <laughs> um, but you might, I mean, one of the things it's, it's funny because you hear stories about people who have come back in weird circumstances where um, somebody went off and, um, but when they came back to the church, they were, they were more unbearable. Like now they're just, they're, they're throwing all this stuff at me and it's very, you know, right wing, left wing, it's political now as well, but they're back. Um, it's not probably what we imagined, but, but if you can imagine and if you can say yes to it in prayer, as St. Claude says, you are preparing your soul and you are allowing God a free hand to be able to work more. All right. So this next question is, um, how do we go about repairing our relationship with our adult children in order to help guide them back to the faith? <laughs> so he's just looking at his watch for those I couldn't see. <laughs> uh, uh, that's, I mean, there's obviously, there's a lot of layers to that. And there's a lot of practical things that could be said, but let's, I'm going to say, I'll stick to the topic where we are. And I'm going to say that far and away, and, and I say this because this is all, this is deeply on my heart. The most powerful thing to repair those relationships is to deepen your surrender yourself in your relationship with Christ and to start really trusting in his providence moment by moment, second by second and saying, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, to the things that bother you, to the things that you'd rather not have, to the, um, the, the, the boring acquaintance who buttonholes you, uh, to, the, to the coffee that's too hot or too cold, to the traffic that's snarling up, uh, to the weather that's ruining your vacation, to being able to, in each of these seemingly insignificant ways, uh, to be able to recognize and say, yes, God, you can do this. I trust you. Um, I will say yes to these things, not to sin. We don't say yes to evil, but uh, most of the circumstances we complain of and that we have issues with in life aren't about evils. They're actually about uh, getting an in interrupted sleep or having a uh, sickness or headaches or the, all the thousand things that happen in a day where we don't acknowledge God and we certainly don't say thank you. We don't say yes. And I would say, if you can make that kind of thing a practice and a habit for yourself, never mind the way you pray that for other people, um, that is the precondition both for your soul as well as for your attitude and for your various internal predispositions to be able to alter any relationship because it will change you. It will just fundamentally change you. You cannot do a practice of surrendering to God's providence moment by moment 
to really practice it, to really put your heart into it and to, and to say, I am doing this. I am, I am going to live understanding and being aware that he is acting in all these things, even if it seems like it's stuff that I don't want and I don't like right now, to be able to acknowledge him and say, yes, you become a completely different person. And probably one, I'm going to say definitely one, who is going to relate to your children differently and they will pick it up even if you said nothing they'll feel it from you they'll sense it out of you you will be giving them so much space um, to be able to be approachable you'll give them um, so many things so it's not about to me from my mind it is not about thinking the right things to say or the topics to avoid there's the the type of particular advice that might be useful to very particular people in their circumstances I would say the only thing universal that I would want to say is transform yourself in your relationship with Christ, I should say. It's not really you transforming yourself. He does it um, by really acknowledging him, saying yes to him, thanking him for all of the things right now that are the things you don't really, don't really love, don't really appreciate and, and work at it. It is a practice and it, and it takes time but it is definitely something that will alter every relationship you have. Um, I'm trying to, this is a question I'm asking, so I'm trying to frame it properly. Um, would you say that there is a difference between um, knowing if it's really trustful surrender versus like despair or, or <laughs> a resignation that, okay, God, whatever yes. you want. And how do you, how do you discern kind of, what your attitude is yeah i mean you can kind of you can kind of tell by the spirit that you have when you finish the thought really are you at peace are you or are you still are you kind of because there is a kind i mean there's levels of surrender and there's very i think i drew up a list of my own that i could point to nine, like nine or ten levels and and they're all surrender but some of them are not ones that we would say are great like the one where it's just kind of giving up resignation kind of thing like well, okay whatever you want Lord. like okay uh, this happened well i guess it's your will I, that kind of resignation i mean you can you can feel in your body language that is that's not it it really is a thing where you start to gauge um your uh I'm going to say your emotions are a factor, especially when you're actively thinking, because we react to the thoughts that we have in, a more, in an emotional way, even if it's very subtle. Um, but when we're talking about surrender and we're talking about that sort of thing, the, and this is why it's tough, is to get to that point. I always tried to get to my, uh, in my prayer for this, to get to the point of being excited in my yes. And that's really difficult to do unless you just practice, practice, practice. So I could say yes. And, it, you know, you'll hear it in my voice going, yes. <laughs> or I could genuinely go, yes, I get it. You can do this. You can do this. I'm going to say complete yes. And you can feel the difference in you. It's really, it really is pretty instantaneous. But it does take practice. So one of the things is you can start at the point of resignation. <laughs> you can start with, okay, well, I guess it's your will. Let it be done. Um, but keep doing it and keep trying to get to I, the, the two things that I, the two words or uh, that I that I like most in surrender are a, a full sort of yes, that word yes, but also most especially thank you. If we can say thank you, and not just the, well, thanks, but, the, but no, I don't know why, but I trust you, so I thank you. Um, you can just take a few seconds after you've said it and, and gauge within, and you realize really quickly whether that was uh, something that was kind of deflating or something that provides peace. Um, we have a request for you to share your chef analogy again, your world-class. <laughs> it was very much appreciated. And I think there might be some new people that joined us. So if you can repeat that one more time. So, and of course I'm going to repeat it and it'll be totally different this time. Um, 
Yeah, I just imagine as being about the relationship, right? I mean, it's the it's the relationship with God. And it's that quote, even from what we're talking about from here, the um, quote from St. Claude, that's uh, kind of the headline of, of this talk. Um, we are built for relationship and, and our whole faith journey is about relationship. And it's about relationship with God primarily and number one. And when we're praying to God, which is communicating, right? I mean, that's communication really at, at, its, at its heart. It's communication. Um, and before I get into the chef story, I'm going to back it up. I'm going to embellish it a bit. I'm going to say it is very much like the spousal journey, right? It is a spousal relationship. And um, can you imagine a scenario in which you're married to the one that you love? You, you've said the words I do, which is kind of like us making our profession of faith. And you've said that, and then you spend most of your day ignoring the other person. And when you do talk to them, you simply have a litany of tasks for them to accomplish in the way that you want them accomplished for you. Um, that's, a that's a really rocky, rough relationship. But when you think about our prayer life and you think about our relationship with God, there are some similarities there. We don't usually spend most of our day um, being aware of him. And I don't mean you have to be talking to him all the time, just having the awareness of the other, having awareness of God. And then imagine coming into the relationship or coming in, in, your, uh, in the evening to your spouse and instead of a litany of requests and so forth, you first listen and, and you say, what's going with you? And, and the thing in your heart is, what can I do for you? What, how can I please you? And being open to whatever they're going to give you. That's really better relationship. So the chef story is basically, imagine you're married to a world-class chef and, and that you are not really a foodie or, or not a, um, a cook, but you're married to a world-class chef. And you ask, and that world-class chef, God, is in love with you and just cannot wait to give you the greatest meal you have ever had flavors and tastes that you've never experienced even but it's just full and it's going to be beautiful and they know exactly what your tastes are um, they know that chef knows exactly what you'd love to taste and how much food you should have and, and how it's going to sit with you for the next hours and it has all kinds of things in mind for how that chef is going to prepare the meal for you but then you say but i want the meal cooked in this way and I want you to use these ingredients and not those ingredients. And then, and now I want you to do it in this order. And I want you to do it with these, um, with this much food and don't do it this other way. And I, I, I remember I liked this particular ingredient and flavor before. So just throw that into this other thing that I'm telling you to do and um, make sure you do it in this way. There's this much food. All of, you just take the whole thing over how what are you doing to the chef the chef wants to please you and deeply please you and at the same time you're not kind of letting them so a few things will happen from that the chef knowing what would please you at the same time respecting your will won't go way outside of it but also won't give you exactly what you wanted because of course it would taste awful if you did it the way that you've described. And that chef isn't going to give you something that's absolutely awful either. But it's not going to be this great feast of, um, of something amazing that could have been possible if you'd simply trusted the chef and said, you know what? Cook it in the way that you think. Cook what you think, how much you think, and when you think. And I'm going to just trust that whatever comes out is going to be something I like because you love me, because we're in this relationship and you know me and you're the master chef. That's the story. Thank you for entertaining us. <laughs> <laughs> um, to follow up on that, what do you think are um, the barriers that most of us have that make it so difficult to have that trust and to be able to surrender? I think we're not used to seeing, um, I mean, in a certain sense, we're just 
victims of original <laughs> sin and just take it from there. But I think one of the primary things is about vision. And, and I'm, I'm going to say faith is primarily about vision, not the kind of sight that Jesus was talking about the Pharisees having, but real vision. And, and seeing beyond this world. So I, you know how we, you know how we often say, oh, that's the, those are this, the, those are first world problems. And you realize when you say something like that, like your TV broke and you're all upset. And then you, then, then you hear about, you know, these people in Africa who are barely surviving and pardon me, they have another famine and so forth. And you realize, oh yeah, I just, I've, my phone broke, my TV broke, this world problems. And you realize you've been caught up in something that isn't as essential. We all get that when we say that. And I think it would be even better if we had the acknowledgement of this world problems, not first world problems, but this world problems. We tend to be caught up in this world as if it were the, um, and I mean, this world, I mean, not the totality of things, but, but the very temporal world. So the things that satisfy our senses, the things that satisfy our habits and our desires and all of those sorts of things, very temporal stuff. We tend to really just stay in them. We tend to be fixated by them. We tend to be ruled by them. And we tend not even to think outside the box of them. And the antidote for me in that has absolutely been the recognition of God's hand in the moment by moment things that happen to us. Um, Megan, I, you've heard this a thousand times, I think, but um, I often tell people, just start with traffic and weather. You know, they're, they're much less about people than they are about events, but um, there are people who will, and I, I hear it constantly, especially in Vancouver when it's raining. Oh, it's terrible out today. Oh, that's awful weather, etc. And as St. Teresa of Avila said, there's no such thing as bad weather. It's all gods. And and the little practices of being aware of not just that he's sending the weather, but that that's something to be thankful for, that that's something to use as a practice to be able to say, can I like this? Because honestly, if he has sent it or allowed it, which is equally powerful, if I can say yes to the fact that he has allowed this or, or actively put this in front of me, then... I'm acknowledging him. I'm stepping out of the this world stuff right there. And um, it transforms the this world reality for us. It transforms how we go about things day to day. It makes us a lot more relaxed. Yeah. It makes us a lot more capable of handling a lot more types of things in the temporal world because we're fixed on a deeper relationship and recognizing that the temporal world is a, is an access point for our relationship with god he speaks through all of these temporal things he just doesn't want us to be consumed by them and i think the biggest obstacle we have is that we substitute the primary reality of god and that relationship for the for just the temporal one and we can use the temporal in order to get back to the primary by acknowledging him and all those things yeah, I remember when you, um, I think it was just over 10 years now, maybe when I first heard um, you, you speak about this, and I remember you taking us on an exercise where we walked around the block, and we weren't allowed to talk to, to the other people around yeah. us, pretty much anything that ever distracted us while we were on that walk, we were meant to yeah, do just as you say, you know, acknowledge um, that that was, that that was God, um, and, and thank him for, for bringing that to our attention, and then just keep walking. <laughs> Yeah. And, and it's quite amazing, isn't it? Like, I remember coming back and we've done this exercise. This is something to do with a lot of people since then. And, and some people have come back crying because it's a reality they're not aware of. Um, and the exercise is basically to, and, and you can do this as an individual practice, but it gives you a, um, as an individual thing that you can do as a practice. And it can just be five minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes, but it gives you an awareness of what life could be like all the time actually can and, and that is to go outside and whatever the weather is and to not be speaking to anybody not to be looking at anything but to be looking at all of the events of reality they're touching that are going to be touching you as god's hand and god's action and be talking to him and simply thanking him for it saying yes to it but actively over and over and over like you're internally saying thank you for this rain oh i tripped on that pit of sidewalk 
thank you for that sidewalk. I'm glad. Thank you for letting me trip. Um, and people have had some very profound experiences with it. If you can do that in a simple walk around your block, or um, and I do say, you know, don't don't get hit by a car or anything. Don't be zoned out. But in fact, you're actually zoned quite into everything that's going on. You're simply seeing it in the practice as an opportunity to thank God for it, to be aware of his presence in it, and to be, um, and to be able to say yes to it. Amazing things, by the way, also happen when that becomes the practice, because you start to become aware of a couple of new, I'm going to say realities that are always there and available, but we shield ourselves from them. And one of them is by saying yes to things, by not having this confined thing of our attitudes being, I'd, I want things to be this way. I'm thinking of other things in other times and places. Um, I want the weather to be, et cetera. I, all that stuff sitting there, if it's all gone, you're just simply much more aware of more possibilities. And there are more opportunities for, um, I'm going to say charity and evangelization that come up just naturally as a result. Um, the other thing that happens is you start to be able to have a ongoing, continual conversation with God. You get to be able to pray constantly, in a sense, because prayer isn't just, just like in the spousal relationship. You're not always talking to each other, but you're always present somehow to the other. And um, this gets that habit going to be able to be present to what God is doing. And then through the events of your life and the things that he allows and puts in front of you, you start to have something of a bigger picture conversation with God that you wouldn't get otherwise, that you wouldn't get sometimes even in the quiet reflective moments that you have, which are also part of prayer and, and life and awareness with God. Um, I was going to ask you to share, um, you know, what, drew you to this particular type of type of prayer and spirituality or, or how were you introduced to it? Um, I'm going to say in two days time was my birthday. So it was the Annunciation. I was born on the Annunciation. So I blame it on that. Um, the really, and in fact, I, I say that um, and I can always, always, I can almost tear up because of it, because it wasn't until gosh, 10, 15 years ago um, in Hermitage that God showed me that he'd had this for me all the way through my life. And there was a time when there was a, uh, a really, really difficult time in my life as a very young adult where I was not in the church. And um, I used to write letters and I write letters to God, even when I didn't necessarily think he was going to be listening. And I'd uh, spirit them away. And, and what I didn't know was that I was writing in those letters at the time, stuff that is part of my life now. But I'll say that a turning point or probably the thing that um, most drilled it into me in a way that was deeply beautiful and profound and that I, I, I just, I do, I thank him constantly for is um, um, this little book called Trustful Surrender to Divine Providence. and. Um, it's where I first learned about St. Claude. He was Blessed Claude back then, but he's St. Claude now. Um, that little book um, I took with me when I walked to Denver in 1993 to see the Pope. And at one point in that journey, there was an extremely difficult situation where um, myself and my friend, who was not Catholic, in fact, didn't even really believe in God, who was with me, just wanted to go for a great hike, um, we both took that book and we just did the book. We did this practice as uh, what we're talking about of, and we did it out loud to each other, just as a practice. We had nothing else to do. And we were in a horrible situation. The weather, the conditions we were in were just really, really challenging. So uh, we had nothing else with us. We decided to do it. And so out loud, we would say to one another, it's really cold, but I want to be cold because God's allowing it. Um, this, this fire won't light, therefore, thank you, God. I don't need this fire to be lit right now. And we would constantly do it all day. <laughs> we didn't have anything else. We did it all day. And we had to try and be as, as sincere as possible, no sarcasm, et cetera. And the conditions were very difficult. But what we found was, as each day went by, 
not only could we actually embrace it and truly believe it in our hearts, but it started to transform our very souls. And by the end of seven days of that kind of experience, we were in what I will call a kind of ecstasy of watching God's will flow through everything as the most beautiful, profound thing, and that it's always going on and that we just need eyes to see. Um, that set the course for me. It also was the kind of pivotal point for my friend who, of course, became Catholic. Um, and it's still a reference point for us all the time. We can't um, can't go back on that. A, a, a story that I was that I um, could relate, and that is um, has bearing for this group is one that I've shared before about um, Saint Claude. So Saint Claude's my guy. He's be because of that book, Trustful Surrender to Divine Providence. When I first read the book, it was Blessed Claude. And in the uh, late 80s, there was a miracle um, that happened as the direct result of uh, prayer for him regarding and with one of his relics for a priest in California who was really miraculously healed and uh, just an astonishing, miraculous healing. And, um, and because I knew this book and because I heard about this miracle, I wanted to go down and uh, visit the priest who had recovered and i wanted to visit the priest who had given him when he had claude's relics um to me that was just a beautiful i just so desired that it was a desire of my soul is the way i put it and i prayed to god to let me go and i prayed that i'd be able to go to uh, saint claude's canonization i wasn't able to i was never able to get down to california but it was it remained as a wish of my soul it remained as a prayer that i just I said, okay, well, I guess if, if that's to be, then thank you. And um, I've stayed very close always to the practices of a practice of surrender to divine providence ever since. And um, uh, 25 years later, I was in my little tent in Hawaii and I was praying. And again, I was reading St. Claude, Jean-Pierre de Cassade, all the great classic works on divine providence and surrender. And for a while there, I started thinking about some of the other spiritual gifts. And I, I actually started to ask the Lord, just sort of a final <laughs> test of the Lord. Do you really want me to stay just so focused on surrender to divine providence? And because um, there's these gifts of healing and there's, um, there's these other... Um, theological and philosophical practices that, that are really beautiful too. And I was kind of hoping for a bit of a, a sign in that way, but there was this one evening where um, a healer was coming, like a Christian healer was coming and it was going to be right near where I, where my tent was. And I thought, Oh, this is great. This seems like a confirmation. And at the same time, my little tiny church, St. Teresa's in Keikaha on the West side of Kauai was having a, a parish sort of mission retreat these um, that I'd already had said yes to. It was in the same night. So I thought, oh, darn, I have to go to that. And um, I said, okay, yes, Lord. So I went and I thought, oh, okay, well, if this is really, really dry, terrible stuff, I might leave halfway through and go back to the other. And it was really dry and it was really boring. These two guys, these two uh, lay people were talking about some um, mystic in California whose cause for canonization or beatification was, was underway. And they were talking about the mystical humanity of Jesus. And it was all fine, but I was getting essentially ready to leave when I flipped to the back page of what they had as a pamphlet. And there was a quote by St. Claude de la Colombière. And nobody quotes St. Claude de la Colombière. I'm the only person I ever heard of that quoted him before. So I just had to ask them at the, at the break, you know, where did this come from? And so I went up to one of them and, they, and I said, what is this? And he said, um, you'll want to stick around for the second half. Uh, so I said, okay, I, I will. So I told him my story with St. Claude. And then in the second half, he revealed that um, he and this other man were going about doing the work of trying to... Um, spread the message of, I believe her name is Cora Evans, a mystic in California. Her cause for, for beatification is in their hands. And it was given in their hands by a priest. 
And this priest is the one who had the relic of St. Claude and who had been the one sort of administering in a way the miracle from so many years ago. And they said, I get emotional right now. I can't talk about this without tearing up. And they said, we have it here. We have the relic of St. Claude. And they blessed everybody with it in a they had it in a pouch because they they travel so many places i guess that um and they also had a relic of saint margaret mary alacoque and um but they drew me aside afterward and they said based on what you told us about your journey with saint claude they took the relic out and they prayed this beautiful special blessing over me with the relic and i tear up because this happened 25 years after I prayed for it and I'd forgotten it. And it was, like I said, it was a wish of my soul, but it's something I had prayed for truly back then that I really did want. And he not only delivered it to me in the last place I could imagine, but right at the moment when I was discerning something re regarding this path. And it just, it really blew me away. God's faithfulness in these things. He may not be there when you want him to be, but he's always going to be on time. And the blessing that was said, the, the blessing that Cora Evans received from God, a blessing prayer that you say to other people, this is what they prayed over me with the relic was, may God bless you with all the desires of the Heavenly Father and the wishes of your soul, which is exactly how I had understood it. So we never know the kinds of seeds that are being sown by the things in our lives that God has got a plan for, that's in his timing, that's in his hands, that we just have to let him act and trust, and he will perform miraculous things. Wow. Oh. That's a beautiful story about God's providence right there and, and being able to trust in his timing. And, and um, you know, as you shared during your presentation, that yeah, it's not always on our time, but it yeah. will be in his. Yeah. Um, well, maybe that we'll, we'll use this next question as our, as our last question to wrap it up, because I don't think we can top the story that you just told. <laughs> um, but somebody just wanted to clarify the, the title of the book that you recommend, or the, the title of the book that you were just referring to. Trustful Surrender to Divine Providence. You'll find it's a, it's a TAN publication, T-A-N, very often that's, I think others publish it now. Um, there are two authors, so it, it's excerpts from two different authors. One of them is um, Father Jean-Baptiste um, bon, Jean Saint-Jour, and the first excerpt is very catechetical. The first half of the book, little book, by the way, you can read it in one night easily. Um, the first half is by him. He was the favorite author of the Curie of Ars, this guy, this, um, Baptiste Saint-Jour. And the second half is Claude de la Colombière, St. Claude. Um, it is one of the two books that I recommend on the subject. And this is the one, if you're really not familiar with it, it gives you the he catechizes you and gives you exactly what you need enough for me and for my friend to be able to say this is a practice that's lifelong and transformative trustful surrender to divine providence the other one of course is a very famous one from jean-pierre de cassade which is abandonment to divine providence a particular translation translation of that that is updated that i really like is called the joy of full surrender it's the same book Jean-Pierre de Cassad, a classic, and that's much more mystical in a way. It's much more story. It's much more, um, it's not catechetical in its approach, but it's deep and powerful and beautiful as well. So those are the two that I'd say. And perhaps we can find some links to those books. And again, sure. when we send the follow-up email, I, I wanted to make sure that you were, that I wanted to hear the title from you before I, before I did it. But at some point I snuck off camera because I have that book. There it is. <laughs> And as I said, I've heard Makani speak, um, yeah, at least 10 years ago now. And I only finally got around to reading this book last year. Did you? <laughs> I, did, I, did, but I did read it. And as you said, it is a short read. It's, it's, yep. it's, it's wonderful. And yes, thank you again so much, Makani. You know, I, I, as you said, I've heard this talk. I've heard you speak multiple times, but um, it's always resonated me. And thank you so much for, for sharing with everybody here tonight. We hope that it's resonated um, with all of you as well. 
And maybe before we ask Makani to do our closing prayer, um, I'll ask Sister John Mary to just bring up on screen. Thank you. So um, for those of you who have already been journeying with us through St. Monica's mission, we're glad to see you again here tonight. Um, but for those of us who, or for those of you who um, have just joined us because of an interest in Makani's talk um, and wish to continue journeying with us through St. Monica's mission, uh, we have a few events that are coming up in the next couple months. Uh, so on Friday, April 4th, we will have an online Stations of the Cross. Um, and from April 8th to the 16th, we will have a St. Monica Easter Novena. As we know, many of our children that are no longer practicing the faith often have somewhat of an openness to come back to Mass um, at Christmas and Easter. So we had this Novena um, before Christmas last year, and we will do it again uh, before Easter this year. Um, and then we will have an online rosary on Friday, May 6th. Um, and a, we have a holy hour every month. Uh, we won't be having one in April just because of uh, the way Easter falls. Um, but our next holy hour will be on Friday, May 20th at Good Shepherd Church in Surrey. And if when you registered, you indicated that you wanted to be added to the St. Monica's Mission email list, um, we will be adding you and you will be um, informed of all of our events and initiatives that we have coming up, as well as receive our weekly newsletter um, with words of, of um, inspiration and, and encouragement as you continue in praying for your children. So Makani, if you don't mind, um, leading us in a closing prayer. Right, I'm going to take um, day one of the Surrender Novena, which, thank you, will be something that you can send around afterward. Um, and it's very short, day one. <laughs> so, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Why do you confuse yourselves by worrying? Leave the care of your affairs to me, and everything will be peaceful. I say to you in truth that every act of true, blind, complete surrender to me produces the effect that you desire and resolves all difficult situations. O oh, Jesus, I surrender myself to you. Take care of everything. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you once again, Makani. Thank you to all of you for joining us this evening. Thank you to Sister John Mary for helping behind the scenes. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at some of our future events. Have a great evening and God bless. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Makani. Thanks, Megan. <laughs>